Morning. Everybody hear me okay? Yeah? There's a few struggles, but we'll get started. Um, this is my first time at GERCON, and I first need to thank everybody in the vast audience today because this has lived up to all the hype. And like many of you, I've been to a lot of conferences, spoken at some, been there just you know, to, to soak up the learning at many others, and it's refreshing when the hype lives up to you know, the expectation, and it definitely has. So I'm grateful to all of you because this crowd is a whole different breed of chill, and I appreciate that. Um, my name is Chad Kalis. When I first submitted uh, this talk um, a few months back, um, it was Life, Death, and the Nematodes, Long Live Cyber Resilience. My work is focused on resilience, um, mostly on the people side of InfoSec. Um, I come from a technical background, but as time has gone on, I've found myself moving more and more into the behavioral economics side of InfoSec. And so um, I'm going to share with you some things that have worked well in my work, um, some, hopefully some concrete examples that can be useful to you um, in this context. Um, this has, you know, like everything we do in InfoSec has been iterated upon, um, so it's not really very relevant, this title anymore. Um, it, it then kind of iterated into, we need better UX, blame TV dinners, and the working title right now is Dear InfoSec, Ketchup. So welcome. Thank you for making time for this today. Um, a lot of what I do involves a lot of listening, um, reverse engineering, a lot of stories to um, learn what makes people um, care about certain things, um, fear certain things, and, and get to a lot of the reasons behind why certain design decisions were made. There's a lot of reasons for those things. There's a lot of reasons that those things are not aligned, whether it's politics, budgets, all kinds of reasons. Um, and sometimes uh, my most valuable tool to get to the root cause of those challenges is stories. And so I'd like to start with the story behind why most people most of the people we work with and for don't think about these things quite the same way that we do. We think that they do. We take our fluency in these things for granted. It's easy to do it, especially these two, security and privacy, because these are driving so much of our industry culturally, certainly technically. Um, so I'm going to tell you some stories about why people think the way that they do why it's such a challenge for us to transmit to them some of these things that are really important, that we're not just trying to sell them these ideas. These are very useful things for them to know. To elevate them is not an easy thing to do and, and, and help them understand and be open to that understanding. Um, and I'm going to start back here because this was pretty important, um, not just because of the start of the Civil War, which was heating up right about this time, but there were a couple of dudes um, Majors and Waddell, who started what's arguably um, the oldest and most famous network in the history of the United States, which was the Pony Express. And this was revolutionary for a number of reasons. At, at the dawn of this, in April-ish, 1860, it took about 30 days if I wanted to send a message to my friend Sean from the eastern side of the country to the western side of the country, it's about 30 days. By the time Sean's reading my message, it might not even be true anymore. Right? So these dudes thought, we're going to reduce that to 10. 10 days. That was revolutionary. Right? But culture had to do a lot of catching up to this because they weren't used to it. Right? Wells Fargo, companies like that, were doing it in 30 days with you know, carriage, ship. Um, so this was very disruptive. Um, and they made a lot of mistakes, as you can probably imagine, because they'd never operated like this before. So things like resilience, this is, this is kind of the relative information security policy of the day. Anybody who they were you know, able to convince to, to, to work for the Pony Express, anybody crazy enough to work for the Pony Express, signed this. I don't know if you guys can read this. It's kind of insane. Um, I can't imagine that these guys and gals who were riding across the prairie for days at a time weren't reading my mail by firelight, right, as the flames licked up their backs, keeping predators and 
marauders at bay, but this was their first attempt at a policy to try to get everyone on the same wavelength about what it meant to protect people's privacy and security. Did it work? Who knows? Meanwhile, if you lived anywhere along this route from St. Joseph, Missouri, to Sacramento, California, man, this was Amazon, right? You had access to goods and services that nobody had previously had access to. It was somewhat cost prohibitive, right? So there was a demographic that was using this. Sound familiar, right? Some things really don't change that much. They were discovering what a single point of failure was, riders and horses, right? They were riding these horses so hard, so fast, they were learning some lessons just as fast, was that they had to have horses at the ready every 15 miles. They had to have stations set up every 50 miles. By the time they were done, they employed some 4,000 riders, 250 some checkpoint stations from you know, end to end, and had a whole new concept of what resilience, they didn't use that word yet, but for what it meant to keep a business like this operating 24-7. Right? The lifespan of this business was 18 months. Right? Kind of like a lot of startups these days. But they solved a lot of problems. And as soon as the telegraph was introduced in October of 1861, two days later, the Pony Express ceased to exist, and they started all over again, solving a lot of the same problems. Did they learn? Yes and no. A little later on, this started to become mainstream, disrupted things, right? Still the same challenges. In fact, there were no driver's licenses. There were only three or four states that even issued licenses, and it, there was no test. It was more formality. You learned how to drive from the person who sold it to you. And car insurance wouldn't even be a conversation for another 25 years. Sounds kind of familiar, right? Who's teaching us how to use the hardware that our teams are using? Same sort of thing. You know, mechanics have had a lot more practice at this. You know, transmitting complex ideas about things to everyday people, and they've gotten pretty good at it, right? When the car breaks down and I take it into the shop, generally speaking, those guys are pretty good at transmitting an idea to me that doesn't overwhelm me, but makes me feel pretty confident that the car's safe again to transport my family around in, right? They, we want to get there. That's where we want to be. Oh, he doesn't agree with me. But look, they learned a little bit because there's a sign, maybe the first sign of resilience, a spare tire, arguably one of the most perfect business continuity strategies ever invented. Fast forward a few more years, this was a very weird year, right? Now keep in mind some of the messages that are kind of indirectly being sent to people about things like privacy and security. Anybody want to date themselves? Know who this guy is? Truman, right? So there's no way we could have known when this guy started talking about atomic research, what that was going to lead to. No way we could have known that. You know, Cold War, there was a long path ahead, but it all started right here. 53, man, there was something in the water. This was just one thing. Anybody know who this is? Les Paul, Mary Ford. These guys revolutionized the way media was created, right? Bands like Kansas, they have 27 tracks of guitars, you know, Smashing Pumpkins, you know, now we take it for granted because there's tracks upon tracks upon tracks. Started with this guy. He invented it, right? And it was like a home studio kind of deal, right? He was liberated from the machine. The machine was like, huh, what are we going to do about this guy? How are we going to monetize this and, and make this ours? How can we own this? In October of that year, the very first commercial targeted at children aired during the Mickey Mouse Club advertising this gun, the Thunderblatt. 
So the, for the very first time, play as a word became defined as something you bought in a store. So finding a stick in the yard wasn't going to hold up much longer. Right? So all these things were happening at the same time, and some messages started to kind of be sent, either intentionally or unintentionally, by these events, right? We throw a pebble in the lake, and some ripples go out. And we don't always see the effects of those ripples until we get a, further, a little bit further down the path. That same month, that same year, Swanson's and Sons introduced this, and it changed the way that we had dinner at night. You could say, you could argue, that this was when we first invited technology to be the host of us, right? This removed us from a lot of the work, a lot of choices. A lot of it could be chalked up to convenience. But nonetheless, we were just kind of abstracting ourselves from making some decisions about things, right? No longer did we have to decide what we we're going to have for dinner, what we we're going to have for a side and a second side. It was all decided, predetermined. So we sat watching TV and eating these predetermined meals for the first time in earnest. 53 was the year these guys made a presence that was unprecedented. So we were going through drive throughs We were starting to become, you could say, a little more isolated. We weren't going out to eat. The ritual was starting to change in a major way. Right? What did this mean for things like privacy and security? How was that starting to shape that conversation? Nobody really thought about it. You could say a lot of people still aren't thinking about it. For the very first time, architecture, and architecture is a, is, a, is a kind of a big interest of mine, just as a hobby, but I think it's an important litmus, it's an important indicator of a lot of things that are going on behaviorally within our culture. And right about this time, for the very first time, post-World War II architecture started having attached garages that had never existed before. So for the very first time, you could go from your living room to the garage, to the car, to the store without dealing with anybody. So we stopped going to our neighbors to ask for a cup of sugar. And that would have some implications that we wouldn't think about until later on. 1968, something incredibly disruptive happened. Heinz introduced the individual serving packet of ketchup. So, in a nutshell, what collectively, all these things, you know, we could add, you guys are probably thinking, well, what about the train? What about, you know, there's a, a half a dozen other things that were pretty pivotal we could throw in the mix here, right? But for the sake of time, trying to just to illustrate this point, that privacy and security equated these things, kind of indirectly. I don't think it was anybody's intention to make privacy and security convenient, or you know, this, this, this culture of isolation, and fast food, and attached garages, and you know, buying play at the store. It wasn't intentional. Who would, who would design a culture like that, right? But that doesn't mean the same thing now. And if these were the messages that were being sent over the last 160 years, we can't think that we're just going to undo it overnight. That's not going to happen. But we have to be sensitive to this. We have to think this is why a lot of the people that we work with are struggling to wrap their minds around this stuff. Because for the last 160 years, human beings in our very DNA have been sent these messages. And now, it doesn't matter anymore because we can't operate like this in business. We have to take risks. We have to take risks in acceptable ways. But getting there is, is getting harder and harder, right? Because we're not just from St. Joseph, Missouri, to Sacramento, California anymore. And the layers of complexity and the, the sheer level of complexity that we rely on continues to grow and grow and grow. 
So what does that mean for these definitions? What does that mean for these cultural implications that it's our somehow duty to, to be the custodians of? What are some things we can do to challenge that? Well, this is probably a good place to start. Um, I'm going to talk about the elephant in the room for a moment. Because we're all grieving this idea of 100% cybersecurity 100% of the time. It's just not realistic, and our clients aren't buying that crap anymore. Anyway, right? So resilience is tough to, to adopt as a way of perceiving the world and a way of, of you know, supporting our clients while we're going through these stages of grief. And it's just like losing anybody we love or anything we love, this is the first stage. Our clients are going through this as much as our partners and teammates, right? Next up, next stage, does this sound familiar to anybody? Maybe a little? We like to place blame. All right, that's pretty important. And then we do this. Rationalize. That's pretty common. You don't have to raise your hand, but I would bet more than one of you have heard more than one person, client, partner, say this on more than one occasion. And, you know, this is... We could probably have a moment of silence for everyone we've lost to this step. Because it's very real. It's an unquantifiable cost of all of this. And this isn't the answer. This is not uncommon. But it's definitely not the answer. And, and this is definitely not the answer. I bet more than one of you have slewed this out for a aunt, uncle, father, mother. And let's just pause here for a moment. What's that process look like? When, when we see a need, you know, mom and dad are like, you know, we just want to watch something. We just want to be able to watch those, all those old VHS tapes. Can you just make it easy for us to do that? Sure, no problem. But I'm not going to try to explain it to them. I'm just going to do this. I'm not going to try to educate them. I'm just going to deliver a solution that works. That's the least path, you know, the path of least resistance, isn't it? And, you know, I might argue that embracing the inevitable is also the path of least resistance. It's working with nature. And so many domains have tried working against nature, and they've all failed. Climatology, right, uh, urban planning, the list is, is pretty long. You know, psychology, um, they've all tried in, in so many ways. Landscape architects, talk to a landscape architect about accepting the inevitability of nature. <laughs> they have to build with intention around those inevitabilities. Right? And that's really what I'm trying to transmit to you today, that it is possible to do this. But the lack of this acceptance is creating more challenges for us. More and more of this needless complexity. And certainly the fear, uncertainty, and doubt is there's no shortage of that because it's a handy tool. There's a time and a place. Right? I don't want to be so black and white about this, there is a time and a place where we need to create a sense of urgency in people so they understand what's at risk. But this continued snake oil salesmanship isn't helping us achieve what we're trying to achieve. But resilience can help us get there. This, this, this shifting our mindset just, just ever so slightly about accepting the nature of 
the way data flows, the way, you know, we, we've heard a lot of great analogies today in some of these other talks that, you know, it moves like water, right? It's going to find a way. Structured data, unstructured data. How do we solve the unstructured data problem? Well, part of that is appealing to people and establishing meaningful connections with those people and acceptance and resilience might, I'm just suggesting it might be a part of that. I've seen it be successful. So none of this is prescript prescriptive. I'm just telling you what I've experienced in my work with my clients who are all shapes and sizes, big Deloitte sized clients down to very small private law practices, right? regulated industries, energy sector, uh, financial services, transportation, healthcare. Uh, doesn't really matter. It's really the same design driven sort of approach. And I think it's a relief to a lot of people to even just entertain the idea of this, that we can eliminate some preventable risks. And we can also be prepared for some of the ones that we can't prevent, that we have to accept. Right? Because there are always going to be risks that we can't eliminate, that we have to accept, we have to be prepared for those. A lot of people are talking about this. This isn't just one guy saying this is probably a good idea. A lot of Harvard smart people have been talking about this for a while. These are from 2014. These are some of the better, I think, definitions, right? Because those of us engaged in this approach are working really hard to try to define this in better ways, more accessible ways to our clients and our partners. Everybody's trying to find a, a, a new approach that resonates with more and more people. And this is arguably at the core of why a lot of this matters. Because we talk about a lot of vulnerabilities. We talk about a lot of um, systems that are you know, prone to those vulnerabilities. But the vast majority of these breaches are, are really about our fluency and understanding our environments, misconfigurations. Right? If we took some time and intention to understand what we have, the complexity we already have, is that valuable? Rather than adding more complexity and further minimizing our fluency in our own environments? Because this is not a very elegant way to talk about resilience, I don't think. Robert Jordan talks about resilience when he describes Aesop's fables. This is very elegant. This seems to resonate with more people, especially in the business leadership side of things, that you, know, you can be angry that there's no cybersecurity. You can bargain and blame and you know, wishful think your way out of a lot of those conversations. But really, working against nature comes with its own cost. This word has been around for a really long time. It's not new, either. Right? Oddly, when we start to look at when it started to become more widely used in our Western culture, the first entry I could find was two years before the Pony Express popped up. And ductility is really about the, 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 the tensile strength of, of, of materials, like how much they'll bend before they break and things like that. But that was strictly in an engineering context. Right? It's only been in this century that this word has had any meaning or any resonance with some of these other disciplines. Right? And some of you have probably seen National Geographic or you know, those kinds of publications talk about resilience in city planning. Right? Like New York City, when they had the heat wave, there was a, a, a pretty decent resilience strategy in place. They had hybrid generators. They had you know, high performance glazings on buildings. They had window shades. They had lots of different things going on. You could call that defense in depth sort of strategy. Um, but that's starting to trickle down into information security, gratefully, in the past few years. And I like to talk about it in the context of these three pillars. Robustness, we kind of get stuck on this in InfoSec. We think, oh, robustness is resilience, but it's not really. Right? We'll talk about that in a minute. It's definitely an important component. Right? Adaptability is an important component, too, because we have to leave our options open because we love predictive models. 
but come on, there's no real predictive model for any of this. I mean, that's nice. It's a nice thought. But we have to build uncertainty into our strategies for everything. Transformability is key, too. These three ingredients are, are necessary in this resilience cake that I'm going to try to, you know, this recipe I'm going to try to share with you. Um, let's talk about resilience for a second, or robustness for a second, because we get hung up on this. We think that, oh, you know, we'll just stop, we'll brute force stop all these attacks all the time. You know, we'll focus on engineering resilience all the time, and, you know, it won't lead to a maladaptive feedback loop, right? Other disciplines um, have tried this over and over and over again, and when we do this, what happened? Oh, there we go. Um, is it right here? Is it over here? No? All right, solid. When we think about resilience from only a robustness perspective, we're diminishing the power of it. And I'll do my best to try to explain why. That this is a, this is a, a pretty reasonable challenge that we all face, right? That we're, we're pretty focused on this most of the time, right? Um, it's okay to think about the next step. Once this happens, how do we minimize the cost of that attack, right? And we'll talk about, you know, some of those strategies, some of the tabletop exercise and simulations. You know, uh, Dave did a really nice job yesterday's keynote talking about simulations. That's a really important part of this visibility into how prepared we can be when those things happen, because they will happen. When we just focus on this one piece, we're ignoring adaptability and the transformability, which are really important. We get locked into a solution, locked into a single way, and when a threat or, or a situation happens, an incident takes place that is outside of our predictive model, that's outside of what we've prepared for, that's not a position anybody wants to be in. Um, it has to be thought of as just a component, right? If we're exclusively building backup and tertiary systems, and that's all we're doing. In a lot of ways, we're creating uh, a volatile situation, right? It's like in another context, um, like fire-controlled forests is a good example. If we repress or oppress those naturally occurring fires for long enough, we just build up a volatile supply of fuel for when it really happens, and then it's this wildly out of control situation. This is another one, right? We, we do this a lot, don't we? We have a bad process, and we know there's probably a better way to do it, so what do we do? We just build some frameworks around fixing it, post-market, after-market, or afterthought sort of approach, and that creates an enormous amount of risk because then those systems continue to be developed upon. That's a better way to solve for this, right? And in, in climatology and um, ecology planning, they don't do, they, they don't have the room to do this incremental change sort of thing where they're like, oh, you know, we're going we're gonna to try to do this uh, managed transformation. No, they just migrate those habitats to more sustainable situations. Right? There was an earthquake that hit in New Zealand in 2011 and, and wiped out Christchurch. You guys might remember this. And, and they looked at rebuilding the city, like, this is going to be like 40 plus billion dollars. So they identified some red zones where they were like, oh, cost prohibitive to build there, doesn't make any sense. We could do the same thing in our IT systems, right? So creating stable environments from go, you know, ones that are more predictable, might be a, a different way to use our time and resources. And selling that to clients, you know, I, I can imagine somebody saying, oh, you don't know my client. Might be a tough sell. We'll talk about that a little bit more, too. Um, systems that lend themselves to more disruption um, tend to be more predictable. Um, systems that we understand better. We often deploy systems that we could understand better. And the, the down, downfall of those is when something happens, then those deficiencies become glaringly obvious. We tend to treat internal systems differently from external ones. Not sure why that is. Because once someone's in, 
Lorentz, so we would probably want to treat them all with some equity, equity right? Um, test and harden those internal systems the same way we would an externally facing one. Um, there's a lot of value in doing this, and it's, this is something that's kind of a quick win. This is something we could all do right away, right? There's a couple of those in here. Not all of these are huge, tall orders. I know some of you are like, this guy, big ideas. Now, this is an interesting conversation that I would, you know, maybe if we have time for the q and I'd like to hear some of your opinions because this is a tough one. I really, you know, the battles of taste will never be won. Is it manageability, ease of manageability, ease of training, onboarding, new team members, and how to manage vast systems versus, you know, this minimizing the, the, the impact through implementing diverse set of controls? I don't have a good answer for that. It's really a case-by-case -case basis, but that may be a question lingering in your mind. Um, but this is the end goal, is raising the cost for an attacker, right? And that really bridges, that, and, and leverages really adds a lot of value to robustness in, in helping us make that jump to, trans, to adaptability, right? And adaptability, it's a big word, it's a, it's a really big word, and we may all think that we know what we mean when we say it. Um, but what I'm trying to transmit to you about this is that we generally don't plan for it. It's not even on our radar. We know a certain tool set, there's a certain knowledge base that we've built over the years of using a certain set of tools, a certain set of approaches, but we, it doesn't leave us much room to be open to this unpredictability, right? And that's where testing this is a, an excellent choice. And these can be done, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you something real world, kind of true crime. Um, I've done this with clients uh, and convinced them to invite their clients and their partners to these exercises. And at first they think it's crazy. They're like, we don't want them to think that we're expecting an attack. I totally get that, right? But what happens and has happened is when something does happen, they call the client and they say, hey, remember that exercise we did four months ago? Yeah, well, we, we need to do that right now. So we're gonna be sending out some internal and external communications um, about this. And you know what, what happens that's different from when those clients aren't included in those exercises, they blame them. When they've not been included in any of this preparation, the first thing the clients do is they blame them. They don't think, oh, th this is really unfortunate that this happened to you guys. They just blame them. But because they invited those clients to participate in these live exercises, well, in one case that I'm thinking of, it was a live exercise, but tabletop exercises are every bit as effective. And they're friendlier. They're way low overhead. All right, get everybody sitting around the table and, and just throw a, a half a dozen scenarios out, spend a half a day, half an, uh, an afternoon. And those clients go away thinking, wow, what we do is pretty valuable to somebody. And if this happened, these guys are pretty smart for being forward thinking about this. And then when the show comes to town, they call those clients and say, hey, yeah, remember this? They say, yeah, you guys were really smart about planning for that. This is a shame that that happened to you. It's a completely different perspective. So just think about that, because I've seen it work more than once in different cultures, different industries. And you, when you take people along for the ride and you give them a sense of ownership, you will be surprised how they will support you, right? But we can't ask for something until we give something. That's just like any other relationship. I'm not telling you anything you don't already know, right? We do this all the time. We use our threat models from previous situations that were predictable because they fit into our nice predictive models. And we walk away and we're like, oh, you know what? What a bummer that half of these controls fall outside of the insurance, the cyber insurance endorsements for that policy. You're smiling, right? And we do that like, oh, well, it's no big deal. Yeah, it's not a big deal. You know what else is not a big deal? These insurance companies, that, uh, their business model, they're not just gonna let people come willy-nilly and, and fulfill claims for much longer. These requirements are getting tighter and tighter and tighter every day, right? So we shouldn't do this. 
because it's not that difficult to build an accurate threat model. In fact, it's not even that difficult to build one that's even maybe a little more than we need. I mean, nobody wants to bring a tank to a knife fight, right? But we also don't want to bring, what did John say earlier, a knife to a gunfight? We don't want to be in that position either. So that's just something to keep in mind. And notice, these are suggestions. I'm not preaching. I know the situation you guys are in. I know the pressure you're under, and I know what the politics is like. It's not easy. <sighs> Once again, in the context of these security controls, we want to create diversity. We definitely do, but not at the cost of a false sense of security. We don't want to build that. We don't want to create a reputation for ourselves that we can't live up to with our clients, especially. We take the time to migrate those vulnerable systems to more predictable environments, ones that we can be honest with ourselves about those controls and their relevance and their support of those compliance and regulations that we may or may not need to conform to. Man, the sense of satisfaction. Not to mention, I sleep a whole lot better at night. Too much of that complexity will definitely erode our resilience to those situations. So there is a dance there. There's definitely some finesse in choosing the level of diversity and appropriateness. There's a time and a place where that might be a good fit. Kind of goes back to that debate. You know, I'm really kind of jonesing for the end of this. I, I would like to hear some of your thoughts on that because that's a puzzler, that one. But the simplicity, right? Now, I'm not meaning to imply, because some of you are probably sitting there thinking, yeah, well, we've got federated environments. We've got confederated environments. It's really easy to put up a picture of some remote controls that are taped over, and you know, it's a really pretty analogy. But how does that translate into the real world, right? What I'm talking about is the choices that we make that add complexity, that either add value or just help us with our excuses, right? And that's a very real decision. And that's a personal thing. It's a really personal thing, right? But it's, it's a very real thing. And those decisions to reduce the complexity in an organization, it could just be a workflow, right? Something quantitative, or qualitative, rather. You know, the quantitative stuff, you know, that's hacking machines, that's easy, right? People, not so much. So I, I appreciate what some of you may be thinking about this slide. The context I mean is really what risks are preventable that we can either minimize or eliminate altogether. This is the end goal, right? To reduce the cost of an incident and keep our options open because we don't know how that's going to unfold. Those are always really snowflakey, every one of them. It never goes according to plan, right? But this is an important thing to keep in mind, because now that we're going to spend a few minutes talking about transformability, they each kind of inform each other, right? And the cyclical sort of thing is, you can probably imagine, working against the nature of things, you, you know, my clients are sick of hearing me say this, my team probably sick of hearing me say this, have to ask ourselves this constantly. Is this, does this make sense, or am I trying to build a golf course in the middle of the desert here? If I'm going to build a golf course in the middle of the desert, then I better be willing to accept the cost. And that should make sense to somebody. If it doesn't make sense, maybe I should ask what my second idea is. These red zones that I mentioned earlier, the way New Zealand identified these red zones, that's a great analogy for identifying these red zones within our environments. right? Because going back and constantly patching a system that's vulnerable over and over and over again, you know, that may not be the best use of our time and resources or our clients' time and resources, right? Addressing that in a solutions-oriented fashion rather than doing that creates, it also creates value in a conversation. You'd be surprised how such a subtle change can open the conversation and open the door to operating with a client in a different way. But we have to deliver that value first, again, right? A lot of us do this, right? not judging anybody, but we, we do this. When breaches occur, right, I have probably just as many clients as you who prefer to keep those things as quiet as possible among a select group of leadership. And that's unfortunate because 
the clients I have that are comfortable being much more transparent, at least internally, about those lessons, they gain so much from it. You know? And it doesn't really matter how big. It could be something small, um, sort of something bigger, like you know, wire fraud, and being transparent about that. You know, we lost 187 grand. You know, we recovered 13,000 of it. Here's why we only got 13,000 of it back. You guys can help us. Right? And when leadership says you guys can help us, it's amazing how people respond to that when they have a sense of ownership and they feel trusted. The good experiences too. I mean, I don't want to focus just on the bad ones. It's okay to send somebody an email every now and then say, hey, dude, nice job. Thanks for sending that phishing email to IT. Here's a $5 Starbucks card for being awesome. Five bucks can save you a half a million dollar breach, right? Because they're going to trust that you have their best interest in mind. Giving them tools that they can use in their own personal lives to protect themselves and their family and friends and let those kinds of habits inform the kinds of decisions that they make at work, that's what works. That incentive works. It doesn't work the other way around. When we go into these corporate environments and they tell us, oh, you got to use these RSA keys, you got to do this, you got to do that, we're not, I'm not going home and teaching my wife that schwack, right? But if I find a tool or someone empowers me, incentivizes me to use a tool, something that's friendly, that gives me value in my personal life, I'm going to take that to work, right? Especially if it's friendly and accessible and isn't, you know, the friction is, is, is minimal. And you guys know what I'm talking about. There are ways to do this, right? Tools are getting more powerful. They're becoming more friendly. It's how we introduce them that makes the difference. Because this is the wrong attitude. This is really just an attitude. There's a famous story in psychology about resilience. There's a lot of debate about it because some people think it's fiction. There's not any real proof of it because it's, it, it, it emerged in the 60s and Harry Harlow uh, days of you know, love is proximity and he did a lot of vivisection, a lot of ugly experiments on rhesus macaque monkeys and put forward this idea that love is all about proximity. I don't know if you guys know this. It's not the feel-good hit of the century. But one of the premises that came out of this was there was this story that supported the premise that attitude really is everything. And there was this young grad student at the University of Wisconsin at Madison who sold mice. He raised mice and sold them to labs all over the region to help pay his way through college. And uh, one day he got this idea to take a bunch of mice to this lab over here. And they said, hey, these guys are really lively test subjects. These are awesome. There you go. And he took the same batch of, a bunch of the same batch of mice to this lab over here. And he said, you know, these guys aren't very active. They're pretty mellow, probably good as a control, but that's about it. And guess what happened? These mice were lively test subjects. And these mice were good, control, mellow, right? You could do that. Well, you couldn't. It would be unethical to, like, school children. You know, what if a substitute teacher sh showed up and the teacher was like, hey, these guys are taking a test today. They're not really good test takers. But another teacher says, hey, these guys are taking a quiz today. These guys are awesome quiz takers. Does that affect the outcome? You better believe it does. Because we can do this. I've seen it, right? When Facebook introduced 2FA into their dev workflow, you'd have thought that hell was going to freeze over. But they went about it in such a way that it empowered people to feel like they had some ownership over the process. They did it in a way that with input from people, they didn't just unleash it on them. They say, hey, by the way, uh, starting Thursday, we're going to do this thing. No, they included in the process from Go. And it was this incremental thing, gave them involvement in it. That's a much different approach. You guys are lousy test, test takers versus you guys are awesome test takers. This is the goal. This is, we're constantly trying to reimagine how we can refine these processes and be prepared and help our clients be prepared for a broad spectrum of, of unplanned events. Could be cyber attacks. Could be natural disasters. Could be some disgruntled employee, insider. Could be a vendor, third-party vendor, man. I spend a lot of time on third-party risk matrices. You know? 
It's not easy, but you've got to think about it. Here's a quick recap, right? Um, There's a picture of my hometown. I'm from Juneau, Alaska. Kind of a nice place to look at when you're trying to recap a bunch of complicated stuff. So this is really what we're after. We want to think about robustness as a part of the solution, not the solution, right? We're cutting ourselves short because resilience is much more powerful than just this one component. This is going to help us big time because we don't know what the model's going to look like. Our predictive models are illusions. And this is the hardest one of all, right? We have to challenge not just our thinking about this, but our teams, our clients. That's not an easy thing to do. How are we doing on time, guys? 10? Oh, perfect. So. This is really what I'm trying to transmit to you today, is that you know, we can accept this. Acceptance is a huge part of solving this. Um, it's, it's realistic. It does resonate with people when you have this conversation with them being prepared. Um, there's a lot of moving parts when an incident takes place. There's the legal track. You know, these all start at the same time. The legal track, the insurance track, the technical track. How many IT teams have like unplugged stuff or wiped stuff just to get it back up and running? They're just stomping on forensic evidence, right? Resilience gives us an opportunity to go back through and make contact with all of these stakeholders and understand the process end to end so that way there's no mystery. And it empowers them. I tell you, I walk away from these trainings, and everybody feels like what they do is valuable. You'd be surprised how many people don't think what they do is valuable at all. Why would we be a target? What are they after? Oh, maybe they're not after you. Maybe they're after your bigger clients, right? These are going to continue. Like John said, they're going to, you know, they're driven. They're passionate, you know, and, and, and Matt. They're passionate, they're driven, they're, 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 they're going to keep innovating faster and faster and faster. The criminals. So we can evolve too. We can be prepared for a, a broad spectrum of these events. But this is the challenge, right? You walk into a conference room and mention this word, and it sucks all the air out of the room. When we introduce someone, when we're introduced to something under adverse conditions, or something that's not awesome. It's a different experience, right? We're always going to have some inkling, right? If I'm sick, I'm not feeling good, and you introduce me to root beer, every time I drink that, I'm going to have this, this faint memory of, of that experience, right? That, especially that first experience. And we've been really good at this. We haven't helped ourselves with this problem very much. Right? But when we introduce somebody to something in the sunshine, and it may be as simple, you know, Chris Roberts and I have had some conversations about using other words than cyber or even infosec, right? Safety, resilience. It's remarkable how people's posture changes by the words that we use, right? But the angle, the, what we're trying to get at is how do we get in to these conversations with people in a more positive way? How do we get into these meaningful conversations and engagements with clients in a way that's going to help them be open to this idea that's pretty radically different than what we've been telling them? Especially knowing now why they think privacy and security mean convenience and isolation, right? There's nothing about that that's convenient. Security is never convenient. Well, maybe our kids won't grow up you know, with keys, opening cars and stuff, but you know, that's pretty convenient. But other, everything else is, requires some attention, right? My story is just about done. In 2002, the most trusted consumer packaged goods company in the world did something incredibly cool. They turned the ketchup bottle upside down. And I, 
share this with you because I ask myself this question every single day. And what we have been doing for the past forever is this. This brand-centric approach has worked really well for us. But maybe if this is our glass bottle, then maybe, right, and this is just a, just, just a suggestion, maybe turning our bottle upside down is thinking about how to embrace the attacked mindset. I want to give some thanks to Kelly Shortridge, who inspired me with some of the work that she's doing in resilience, and, and certainly inspired my work here today that I'm happy to share with you. She's a brilliant woman. You know, when you have, when time and interest permit, uh, please check her out. Um, this is me. My name is Chad Kalise, and I'm very grateful that you made time to listen today. Good luck out there. If you have any questions, I'd be do my best to answer them. Anyone?